listening to the Mindset Advantage podcast with Elliot Rowe and Dr. Tricia Gardner. Welcome to the Mindset Advantage podcast. So, uh, Tricia, what have you got for us this week? Hey, I got something really good for us today. It is a study that looked at what is the impact of eating chocolate on cognitive performance. And basically, the lead author is a guy named Dr. George Crichton. And what they did is they studied people over a 30-year period, and they found that regular chocolate consumption was linked to several things, including it protected against age-related memory decline. It also improved working memory, reasoning, attention, and concentration. For people who don't know, working memory is sort of like your brain's mental scratch pad. So the more stuff you can keep in your working memory at a time, you know, the better you're going to be able to reason out and figure out problems and things like that. So I want to tell you a couple just caveats, okay? They did look at over a thousand people and it was over 30 years and people who ate the chocolate at least one time per week showed these improvements versus people who ate chocolate less than that. The chocolate that is in question is not the kind of chocolate that you would go and and buy. So it's not like the popular kind of candy bar. Hershey's or something. (laughs) Right, right. It's a very, um, you know, high quality dark chocolate is what people want. And the other thing too is, you know, even though this was over 30 years, it's a longitudinal study, it's still correlational. So there is a chance that they were doing something else that led to this, you know, I can't guarantee 100% that it was the chocolate. Uh, The theory is that there's the flavanols that are in the chocolate and the cocoa that's doing it. So I think if you want to add some high quality dark chocolate to your diet once a week, you may just get these cognitive benefits and, you know, you get a nice little snack out of the deal. So I think it's pretty good. Yeah. And it must have been quite an interesting one when they went for the funding for that. I want to do a 30 year study on people (laughs) eating chocolate. (laughs) Well, (laughs) they got the funding. Hey, you know. Well, they were looking at a lot of other things, but when you track and you get those huge data sets, well, you know, obviously you can end up you know, answering a lot of other questions or looking at a lot of other things. So they didn't set it up initially just to look at the chocolate, but uh, that was a nice little side benefit, I thought. Hey, so um, so yeah, there's a good excuse to buy some very expensive chocolate. So Remember, there, you, there you go, guys. Not the cheap right. stuff. Has, has to be the good stuff. Can't be like this milk chocolate, you know, cheap stuff. You know, go to a nice store and get you some gourmet dark chocolate. And hey, maybe your brain will be working more efficiently. Perfect. Okay, and then this week on the show, we've got Your Doom. He's a well-known poker coach. He's been around the scene for a very long time. And we're going to give Ryan a call now, so let's give him a call. So, Ryan, welcome to the show. If you could introduce yourself to our listeners. Hey, guys. Hey, Elliot. Hey, Tricia. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. My name is Ryan. Uh, I played on Poker Stars as Your Doom um, back pre-Black Friday. Your Doom was my main screen name. I kind of became famous back then. I had the uh, number one overall winnings at 1020 uh, back in 2010. I mean, that was a long time ago. But uh, that's what I did pre-Black Friday. My history before that, uh, I originally started out as a, an engineer. And then I became a high school math teacher. I taught high school math for three years. And then I figured out that I could make a lot more money playing poker 10 hours a week than I was teaching, getting teaching 40 hours a week. So I actually made the switch and became a full-time poker pro. Nowadays, I'm playing on American sites. Uh, I'm doing quite well still. Uh, I can definitely show you guys some graphs if you want to check them out. I also do coaching. Uh, I I sell videos. That's my main business. I have a a training website where I sell instructional videos. No Limit is my main game. And I do a lot of one-on-one coaching. It's something I definitely, I love to have the balance of having the uh, coaching in addition to playing. I mean, coming from being a high school math teacher, I used to you know, sit in front and, and take care of 105 teenagers. And now I sit in an office and, you know, take people's money all day by myself. So it's great. To, <laughs> it's great to have that personal connection uh, with my students too, just to be able to help people out. And well, I mean, of course, it's profitable for me too. I mean, I, I do charge money for it. I'm not, <laughs> not giving it away, but, but yeah, it's, it's really a great, but I think it makes me better at the tables too. Definitely making videos allows me to play a lot better. Uh, just being able to organize my thoughts and, and get it all. I mean, it's like back to teaching too. I mean, the best way to learn math is or learn anything is to teach it, uh, make a video about it or, or talk about it, and then it just makes you better. So everything kind of kind of works together perfectly for me with uh, with my schedule, just playing part time and coaching part time, and then just making videos and, and selling videos on my website. 
And was it a big jump for you to um, obviously Black Friday happened and starting to actually coach people rather than just relying on the money you're making at the tables? Was that difficult? Some players have said to me, I didn't want to do it in case people knew my secrets or something along those lines. So, right. Well, before Black Friday, I never wanted to make a poker. I remember Poker Strategy is the site I used to work for like way, way back in the day. That's where I first started. They kept contacting me and I was like, no, nah, I don't know. I don't want to make a video. Like I make a lot of money playing poker. But then Black Friday happened and I was sitting here and I'm like, okay, okay, now I'll make some videos. At least I'll make some money out of it. The videos got really good feedback. I mean, they, people tell me that they like them. <laughs> I've, I've had students tell me they like them as well. So. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, that was working out really well. And then I figured out that I could make a lot more money selling videos uh, privately, like as a package, compared to uh, making them f- for someone else, for a poker site. I can make you know, considerably more money selling them. And I started doing that. Yeah, no, it's worked out pretty well. So now what percentage of your time would you say is playing and what percentage of your time is teaching, coaching, you know, video creation? Well, nowadays I only play three nights a week, It's usually about a four or five hour session. So it's definitely a part-time job. And then I, I do private coaching at least one day a week. Uh, if I have too many requests, I can get a second day in there. And then I just have other time spent with, you know, just working on my website, like making new video series, new videos here and there, you know, doing marketing, that sort of stuff. It sounds awesome, right, Elliot? Yeah. Nice balance. Yeah, yeah, nice balance. And and that's one of the things. Mm-hmm. I mean, do you feel that that helped take the pressure off the poker, having these different facets to your life? I know there are some guys out there who, you know, being a full-time poker player is very isolating. I mean, do you feel it gives you that socialization? Oh, yeah. I mean, if I try to play poker every night, I would I would just feel like I'm like a worse human. Like it, it can take a toll on you just being in battle all the time um, at the tables. I mean, I feel like just having that balance. And again, like I said, it all kind of goes together for me. Like coaching makes me better at playing poker, which makes me better at coaching, which makes me better at making videos. And it all kind of ramps up and I'm just feel like happier too. Like I, I've never really been like a workaholic type of guy, even when I used to work like in, in offices, like I felt like 40 hours a week. I'm like, man, that's, that's a lot of work. <laughs> Who can work 40 hours in a week? This is crazy. But yeah, I, I, I love my schedule. Like, it's ridiculous. Like, I, I just feel so grateful and, and humble, like, every day that this can be my life. Like, I get to play a game that other people play for fun to, like, make, to make my living, to pay my bills, to feed my family. It's, it's just incredible. Like, I thank God every day, like, that this is actually, like, my one friend had called it, called it my, my, my fantasy camp lifestyle. Like, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> like, like, all poker professionals, if you're doing well, you should feel, you know, just amazing that this is, this is what you get to do in life. You know, we just had Carlos Welch, uh, Hip Hop Trivia, on with us, and he has a very similar outlook in that he's so grateful and happy. And uh, his point of view is that many poker players are some of the unhappiest people he's ever met overall. Oh, absolutely. Um, Yeah, I was going to see. What do you think about that? Uh, Well, that's one of the main reasons I usually don't chat. I have chat off at the tables because everyone's just so angry at each other all the time. It's just distracting. I mean, to me, it's like, like, yeah, this is your life. Like you get to play poker and and, yeah, I mean, it's just people can just get so angry and hostile. And I think it's, I mean, one reason could be they just don't have like any kind of life balance maybe. And I mean, I don't know. I don't want to speak for people, but uh, yeah, I would definitely agree with, with what you're saying. And then obviously there was a few years ago, there was a a thread on two plus two that caused some issues, which we can't get through the interview without discussing. So if you could just explain that situation and sort of how that all played out. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's definitely one of the more embarrassingly stupid things I've done (laughs) in my life. Uh, Well, what happened, I'm sure many of your users, your listeners don't, don't have any idea, but what happened was I, uh, I posted a graph of my last 100,000 hands on two plus two. I mean, this was a a few years ago. This was like two and a half years ago. And at the time I posted it, I didn't really see any harm in it. I mean, of course, it's a legitimate graph. I would never lie about results or anything like that. But the problem with the graph was it didn't have any dates on it. It just had last 100,000 hands, uh, which was accurate. But at the time, and I'm sure we'll get all into all this in in a few minutes, um, I was having a lot of mental issues with uh, volume. Uh, I've never really been a huge volume guy, but back then it was so much worse. I was having really big problems. I mean, you know all about, you've helped me with Elliot a ton. Um, But this was back in 2013 when I was having really bad volume issues and um, my volume was kind of a a bit of an embarrassing point. So long story short, what happened was 
I mean, at the time, I was just kind of getting a little bit, I guess, over aggressive with my marketing. I mean, I think what can happen is if when someone's playing poker, I don't know if this applies to other people. I know it applies to me, but playing a lot of poker can kind of change you a little bit in the sense that you get like a more aggressive mindset in life. I don't know if you've ever heard like if anyone else say that, like yeah, so all looking, for, looking for every edge, you're looking for edges the whole time. Right. So I'm just constantly trying to get every edge I can take, like within the rules, like I don't want to break any rules. So I posted this graph and a lot of people accuse me of being, um, well, some people accuse me of being misleading and ambiguous and, and it was, I mean, I, it's something that I shouldn't have done. It was really stupid and I've apologized for it like a hundred times. I mean, all I can say is, I mean, I've grown a lot since then. I made a mistake. I mean, I'm a human being. I don't really know what else I can say other than just that I still feel bad about it and I just want to keep apologizing for it. But I mean, all of the, like all I can do now is try to like forget about it and, and focus on the positives. And Well, let's be yeah, fair. There have been some pretty serious positives from that as well. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I've, uh, things are a lot different now. I, I've, well, I mean, after working with you specifically, I, I really... <laughs> What, what should, we, should, we, should we actually talk about the, so the mental game issue there? Because it's the sort of thing that people come to me with and they think that they're the only player who has these sorts of issues. And it's not only one person. So we were comfortable talking about from that side, the, the mental game side and things. I know you've written about it in the past. Mm-hmm. So if you want to talk about the way you were struggling with volume and how it was impacting you. Right. Well, I mean, right towards the end, or I'd say, I should say at the beginning of 2011, like right at the end of the pre-Black Friday I was having like the most massive downswing uh, that anyone could possibly imagine. I know probably poker players say that all the time. Like, oh man, I'm having the worst downswing you could ever imagine. But this one was like different. This was every single day, four out of every five sessions, I would just dominate the tables, I felt like, and lose $2,000 and be three or $4,000 below EV. Like, and I was, got to the point where I was about $100,000 below EV. And I think it just damaged me. It like damaged my brain in some sense. And then poker got shut down in America. <laughs> and it was just all like, okay, a lot of bad things happening all at once to me. So then when I finally got back online in uh, a couple of years later, or, or not a couple of years, but maybe a year after that, I was having a real trouble with volume. Like if I played even a thousand hands in a day, I would have a really bad hangover the next day. And I didn't really understand what was going on. And that's, I think that's sort of when I discovered you. I remember I first saw one of your threads on 2 Plus 2 about a, a hypnosis MP3. And I think like most people who like have no experience with that, they're probably pretty skeptical at first. And I like laughed a little bit. I'm like, hypnosis? You want to hypnotize me? What are you talking about? Like, this is silly. But then I think you sent me one and I tried it and it was absolutely amazing. Like, I can't recommend it enough. Like, it literally just completely overhauled my entire mindset. The MP3 itself, I mean, had to increase my A plus volume at least fifty percent, like right off the bat, and then, and then we did a few one on one sessions, and that that took me even further. And, and 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 yeah, I mean, I was having a real tough time, and and I'm really happy that I met you. <laughs> oh, thank you, thanks for all the great advert. <laughs> um, no, well, thank so, you. Yeah. But I mean, the the thing that I really want guys out there to be hearing here is that there are things that you may think um, are happening, you don't understand why they're happening, so. Um, in Ryan's case, this was he was having these hangovers. He was in, it was incredibly difficult to play more than a thousand hands. Any of those sorts of things are they're psychologically created. You're creating that issue as yourself as a defense mechanism against perhaps another downswing, perhaps fear of failure, perhaps fear of loss, whatever it might be for you as an individual. So if you feel a huge resistance to playing at the table or an anxiety that's stopping you, holding you back, or you're just saying, this is just me, I'm incapable of doing X or Y. More likely than not, you're not incapable. There's some sort of psychological defense mechanism, subconscious defense mechanism getting in the way. And that's the sort of thing that um, working myself with Trisha, with one of the other mindset coaches, that's what we look at resolving are these issues that are getting in your way that just don't need to be there. And it can be incredibly expensive to believe that it's something that's going to be there forever. And as you saw, you run. I mean, it's um, things are very different now, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, exactly what you're saying. I didn't know what the issue. I thought, I mean, hey, I'm, I'm, I talked it up to, hey, I'm getting older. You know, I'm, I'm in my late 30s now. I mean, maybe I just something, you know, something to that. I mean, maybe what's my eye doctor? Maybe I need new glasses. <laughs> I don't know what the problem was. And then, yeah, I, I, things are much different now. There, there's definitely shouldn't be. Um, well, nothing should be like that for a healthy, youngish person. Uh, and, and there's definitely, if people are having issues, they should, you know, definitely look to get them fixed. And especially when you, you know, have other capabilities of, of making so much money, you just need to get over some hurdles to, to get to it. 
Yeah, I think people don't also understand the neuroscience behind it. You know, your brain reacts very strongly and very negatively to loss. It's just the way our brains were designed to operate. And what happens is your amygdala gets triggered and and all of our listeners who've, you know, watched my videos or read my books know I love to talk about the amygdala. Because it's it's the brain's panic button. And what sounds like happened to you is that that amygdala was triggered and it just went on and on and on. It didn't shut off. And that can lead you into, you know, depression and anxiety and all sorts of negative things. Right. Yeah. And that makes sense. I mean, that you pretty much nailed it. <laughs> never, yeah. never underestimate the power of the downswing. <laughs> I mean, That's right. <laughs> yeah. The brain is definitely a powerful muscle and, and it kind of <laughs> kind of rules the whole universe. And I mean, another thing I wanted to discuss with you, because I mean, it comes up a lot on the forums and it comes up with my clients and I fall with your side mm-hmm. on this, this side of things, certainly. And that's that if you're a professional poker player, what makes you a professional is looking for the best game you can possibly sit in in the world at that time and playing in the game where you have the highest possible EV. And I know that's something you push towards your students and it's something you look to do yourself. Can you talk about, you know, why perhaps that makes more sense than the other perhaps more forum friendly um, idea of you should be battling regs and proving who's the best poker player in inverted commas rather than looking to make the most money that's available right there in the moment. Yeah, well, that forum friendly mindset is just it's just always been mind boggling to me. Like, I've never really understood that. I mean, I, I mean, poker is a negative sum game. If I like I always tell people if I was the 10th best player in the world, but I always only chose to play against the other nine best players, then I would be a losing player. I mean, good game selection is absolutely critical. Like, I game select very aggressively. I think it's equally as important to just knowing, you know, when to click fold, when to click call, and when to click raise, and just knowing all the skills. I mean, people focus on that, and then they want to get in games and battle against, you know, five winning regs, and it just makes absolutely no sense to me. It, I, I mean, I shouldn't judge everyone. I mean, maybe other people have other priorities. My priority in poker is to make the maximum amount of money I can possibly make out in my session. Like, how am I going to win the most money? Which games am I going to play? Which plays am I going to make? Which play is the most EV? Which seat is the most EV? That's how I'm going to make the most amount of money today. I mean, if, if someone else has a priority that maybe they have a trust fund and they just want to challenge themselves, then absolutely. I mean, sit and play against you know the best players. And now just to clarify this, so uh, since, you know, since that time, 2013, when you've been putting in the volume, just where is your win rate at over that period of time? Um, well, my 2014, 2015, uh, I'm right around 17 BBs per 100. Right. And that's all 2-4 up through 10-20, mostly. And that's the power of game selection. Obviously, you're very good at poker as well. But there'll be very good poker players telling me that they're crushing the games, winning at five big blinds per 100. And it's because they're in those games with the other regs. And they feel like they're crushing, but you're winning at three times more than those guys are. Well, I mean, it's like Feeder Holt said in your other podcast. I mean, good game selection is being good at poker. And, and that's just one of the things you need to implement if you're not implementing in it that already. I mean, I tell people that play Zoom on Poker Stars that, that they're just lazy. I mean, I, I've heard that, well, I've actually heard, I mean, in all fairness, I've actually heard Zoom has gotten better, but it used to be the toughest game in the world. Like 500 Zoom was like the hardest game in the world at least a year or two ago. And people would just sit there and play it. I mean, you're just completely ignoring such a huge element to making money. Uh, it, it just seemed, seemed mind-boggling to me. Well, a lot of the forum-friendly stuff seems to be around ego. And I think you kind of hinted at this. It's like if you are looking to <laughs> fluff up your ego, then perhaps you're going to select a different type of game than if you're just looking at it <clears throat> you know, to make a profit. Absolutely. And this is a problem I see with my students as well is that I keep asking them like, I'm like, okay, you're down you know, $30,000 this year playing three handed with regs. Why do you keep doing it? Uh, because I think I can beat them or I want to beat them or why should I leave the table? I'm just like, it's just like, I have to tell them every single time. It's like, you have to understand this. Like your goal is to, to make money. You're not, uh, I mean, trying to see who the best player is. I mean, I don't care if I'm the best player on my site or the third best player on my site or the 900th best player on my site. I just want to do what I the, play the best I can and make the most amount of money that I can make. I mean, even had the other day, I even had somebody, a really good reg for my site. It was challenging me to heads up because he wanted to, well, like quote, like see how good I really am. And my only thoughts were like, uh, I probably win, maybe not. I don't know. But more importantly, who cares? Like, why would I ever even consider taking a match like that? 
the only time I'm ever going to take that match is if every other player on the entire slate it leaves. <laughs> For me to take a, some kind of like heads up, reg on reg grudge, grudge match would be the most childish, stupid, embarrassing thing I can imagine doing. And I, I just wouldn't be able to live with myself. Like even if I could make 10 cents a hand or in that match, like why would I do it when I can make a dollar twenty a hand playing in, in normal games? That's so absolutely logical. rational. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, my goal is to have absolutely zero ego, like all that stuff, just just to shut all that down. Like if I get outplayed in a hand, like I'll, I'll use it as a learning experience. I'm not going to be like get real mad at the guy for, I mean, people get mad at other players for, pe- for playing poker. And, and it just blows my mind. Like the guy keeps three betting me. I want to kill him. Like he's just clicking, but he's just playing poker. He's just betting chips. Like why can, why, what's the kid so upset about? I don't understand. Like, I guess it's just a different mindset that I have. That um, three betting one you just brought up, that is a hot button issue for a lot of players that Elliot and I work with. And a lot of times, you know, it stems back, you know, maybe something in childhood or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. Uh, But people don't want to feel like they're getting bullied. Oh, absolutely. I can understand that. But you can't look at it that way. I mean, I was doing a coaching session the other day and I told told my student to, to think of his fold button as a weapon. And he said, hey, Elliot Rowe. And I'm like, yes. I'm like, I'm quoting an Elliot Rowe MP3 because I, I hear Elliot's voice in my head, you know, three days I was a week. Thinking I know that one. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. There's, yeah. There's three things I always do before I play a single hand of poker. I, I get a good night's sleep. I exercise and I listen to the Elliot Rowe MP3. And there's no exceptions for me to that rule. But yeah, I mean, being able to fold it because, you know, you shouldn't feel bad if you fold if it's the best, you know, EV play. You should feel good about it. And that's the thing is, it's this difference between people looking to win the pot rather than win the hand. So yeah, folding, you're not going to win that pot, but you've won the hand if your opponent had you beat. So you're not giving him the value he should have had if you hadn't folded. Absolutely. And, and people just are like, I want to win the pot when I'm in the pot. No, it's like, no, you want to win the hand. The pot's irrelevant. The hands over the year are what will make you money. And it just takes a long time sometimes for people to realize that the game isn't quite what they thought. So yeah. when you're coaching the students, you know, who are having some of these ego issues, are you able to communicate effectively with them to the <laughs> point that they stop? Or is it something that most people just have a hard time giving up? No, most people I can. I mean, like I said before, like I was a, I was a high school math teacher. So I have a I mean, I do have a, a teaching background. I mean, I, got, I have a master's degree in secondary math education. So they teach you a lot of that, like psychological like how to communicate things, like how people learn things in different styles. And I mean, some people they just won't hear it if you say it a certain way, but if you like shape it a different way or, or, or like lay it out in like numbers or do it a different, like show it to them differently, then they'll, they'll start to get it. And I mean, it's up to everyone to try to like, you know, have to hear it and they have to you know, agree to it. They can't just hear it and be like, yeah, 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 I know. They have to really like deeply agree to it and know it. And then that's when they're going to make a change. Right. Yeah, I mean, as I say, I think there's there's a lot of people who don't understand that this is actually how you make money playing professional poker. And um, another one, I mean, I know you're not involved in this because you're not an MTT player, but is the, the Pocket Fives top 100 list. And um, there are guys in the top 20 on Pocket Fives are losing money, but they're ranked in Pocket Fives in the top 20 players in the world because the the way they they give out the points for the amount of wins that you've had. So there are guys who are like, they're top 10 in the world and they're down like 80 grand this year. Now you should not be aiming to be at the top of that leaderboard in terms of, yes, you've got the most points. That's completely irrelevant. It's, it's, just, the cashes, most, it's just cashes. So, oh, so you uh, need to be the person or it's, I don't know quite how the point system works, but it's definitely not who's made the most money. The way you should judge yourself is how much money have you made and what's your return on investment per tournament if you're an MTT player. And this follows the same lines of that, but in the cash realm, it's like you should be sitting down thinking, is this the softest table available to me right now? And if it isn't, move to the softest table. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I do that all the time. Like, I mean, if I'm in, you know, play, I play up to four tables at a time. So if I'm in four pretty good games and a new really great game starts, I mean, I'll, I'll scan my four tables, decide which one's the worst wait, sit out next big blind and then, and then switch them out. I mean, I've, I've never even given it a second thought to not do that. You know, just coincidentally, the global poker index is the same way where your top players are not necessarily the people <laughs> with the highest ROI because it doesn't calculate, you know, well, what were their buy-ins in terms of their wins, if you know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, that sounds like nonsense to me then. 
Yeah, well, it undermines everything. You know, if you if you've won five million dollars but lost six million, are you the best player in the world? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm not really an MTT guy, but so I don't, I don't get into all that stuff. But yeah, that doesn't sound. Uh... Well, as I say, it's exactly the same concept of you know the the sort of trying to get to the top of something, right? Trying to prove yourself in some form of way that's just unprofitable for you as an individual. Now, I mean, we've said it before in some of the other shows. So we don't know how much longer online poker is going to be profitable. It might be two years, it might be three years, it might be five years. But at the end of it, when you look back. You would trade that Pocket Five's number one ranking for a million dollars if you haven't got the million dollars. That, that's my assumption. That's what I tell my clients anyway. I, I agree with you, Elliot. <laughs> 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 I mean, that's the only thing that really matters. Is I mean, like I said, how much? I mean, how much money are you making? Physical cash that you can spend? You Unless can... you're running a charity, right? <laughs> <I guess. laughs> well, yeah, for other for other poker players, I guess. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's great if you're doing some charity work with with real charities, and you want to, then you should be making as much money as you can and trying to give back as much as you can to to real charities. But yeah, I'm, definitely don't want to give money to other other regulars. Yeah, it's so interesting. I did want you to talk for a few minutes, just and you kind of did at the top of the hour, but maybe can you say a little bit more about the business side of it and you know developing a business for yourself? Yeah, well, I mean, for me, I mean, I first started doing the coaching. And I wanted them like I just kind of wanted to see how it would play out, and then everything was going really well. And then, but the thing is, it only comes down to how much energy you have in a day. I mean, if you're playing poker and you're coaching, I mean, you're getting paid by the hour. And you, so I tried to figure out a way to get you know more passive income. You know, to sell a video series takes no effort because I already recorded it. So rather than me give the same you know coaching lesson a hundred times, I can make it into a video series, and you know sell it, and and that can be a way to like really boost your income without, um, you know, putting in a lot of extra hours indefinitely. That is the name of the game. But, you know, isn't it curious or maybe, you know, it's only curious to me that most players, you know, they never get into that side of it. Oh, there's only like a few select ones uh, that kind of, you know, are really making a business out of it. And then you hear people kind of talk negatively about those guys. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, my whole philosophy, I, I try not to talk negative about anyone ever because it's just really not my, I mean, unless someone specifically steals from me or does something really wrong to me, I don't, I don't get involved with what, what people are, are doing, even if I think something, even if I think it's you know, wrong or crazy. But yeah, I think a lot of players don't ever get into that. I mean, I think, well, a lot of players don't want to, maybe. I can't speak for all players, but, and I mean, some players just might not be good at it. I mean, I know I've known really, really good players that would just not be good teachers and they didn't want to teach and they just didn't know how to teach because it's one thing to know how to play the hands and how to do it, but you have to be able to convey that information in an intelligent, you know, understandable way to another human. I mean, it takes a different skill set, I think. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, and you've done it as well, haven't you, Trisha? You know, you must see it with the, um, the teaching college students. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I used to be a university professor of psychology for people who don't know. And so, okay. yeah, it is a lot uh, different, you know, when you do have that kind of a background, you know, you're just able to put things out that maybe, like you said, it's definitely a skill set. And if you don't have it, it can be, you know, challenging to get over that hurdle. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And a question we always ask, um, Ryan, is uh, what's the worst tilt you've seen either in yourself or anyone else over all these years of poker that you've played? Have you ever seen some uh, someone go crazy at the table or anything like that? Um, well, well, yeah, I mean, of course, everyone kind of goes crazy at the tables. <laughs> I guess like back in the day, like I back, I mean, I don't play many World Series events anymore. Um, I played like four one year. I've never been a big tournament guy, but I was playing in one like several years ago. And I remember a guy lost a big hand and it was, it was kind of deep into the tournament. And he just he just like got real upset. And he's just like, I'm going to open shove the next hand. And he just like open shoved without looking at his cards, like the next three hands. And he had a pretty good stack. And I'm just like staring at him like, how can you do this? Like, how, how is this possible? What's going on? This does not compute anywhere in my brain or never, ever. Like, what's happening? And I, I'm like, I'm like so upset that I have bad cards every time. And then like, then you like flip the switch back over and then you start playing normal again. I'm just like, what? Uh, yeah. Wow. So he made it. He made it through then, obviously. Yeah, he didn't so get without looking at his cards three times and did not get called. Wow. Wow. I guess it's, I mean, it kind of goes to the whole risk aversion too. Like even if someone looks down at ace queen, I mean, they might make a, a bad play and fold because they don't, well, not necessarily a bad play if you have a huge edge in the tournament, but um, they might make a play and fold because they just don't risk their tournament. 
That has to be a bad player. You've got Ace Queen there, surely. <laughs> if the guy hasn't looked at his well, hands, I, was, I mean, <laughs> I would call with a lot of hands, but I just didn't have anything. Um, oh man, yeah, but I could see like you know like Daniel Negreanu, like one of those like Phil Helmuth type players, where they don't want to you know give up any risk at all and just you know lay down some bigger hands when they obviously rate to have the best hand but yeah, i guess if yeah i mean that, that was just kind of crazy I'm, i've never been like a reactive person like to you know my, any the worst tilt i have is when i get like frustrated and i lose my focus for like a hand or two i think i've always been pretty good with the tilt except for my you know other previous issues obviously the deeper issues but i mean that's not so much tilt as as i say it's sort of an aversion isn't it it's like a sort of safety mechanism to playing right right yeah, and losing focus for a hand or two, you know, that seems pretty mild in comparison to some of the stories we hear. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I can imagine. I mean, yeah, I can imagine that. No monitors in the swimming pool or anything like that. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so Ryan, where can people find um, your training site and things like that if they want to hear more about how to exploit their opponents? Well, I have a training site. It's yourdoompoker.com. Um, we sell all kinds of... Um, training videos. I mean, I sell a lot of no limit videos. We have a PLO expert. We have, I mean, the way the site works is I try to get one top expert for each uh, genre of poker. So we have like a PLO guy, we have a sit and go hyper guy. Uh, we have a, you know, an MTT guy. And then like, rather than just having like everyone come on and make, make videos, I try to find someone that's like going to be really, really good and just have one person. And then they just make like the videos for that site. So it's, yeah, it's your doing poker. You can pretty much find everything there. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for coming on and yeah, telling your side and explaining how the situation works. And if you want to make money at poker, sit at the softest table. It's that easy. Yeah, it seems, <laughs> it seems simple, right? I guess. Um, and what we'll do is um, all your information will be on our page if people want to, to look at that. And if you can send over you know, the graphs and things like that so people can see that as well and just see what is available in the, in the games right now, if they know what they're doing and if they're actually game selecting effectively. Yeah, of course. Well, thanks, guys. I really appreciate you having me on. Amen. Thanks. Thank you so much. Cheers, Ryan. All right. Thanks. So it was really interesting to talk with Ryan about those things. Um, that idea that you know the best poker player is the one who's sitting at the softest table, not necessarily the person who is you know theoretically the best at the game. You know, it's so funny because I play MTTs primarily, and my reaction whenever a really good player comes on the table is he needs to go or she needs to go. But typically, you know, obviously it's a guy. Um, for example, I had Brian Rast. He got moved to one of my World Series tables. And I think some of the other people on the table who might have been a little bit more recreational were like, oh my God, you know, we're getting to play with Brian Rast. And in my mind, I was like, oh my God, he needs to get the boot immediately. Because if he gets a lot of chips, it's really going to make my life difficult. Yeah, and I, I think that's, as I say, it's a difference in mindset. Some people want to play it as a competition and as an absolute sport, seeing the money is just points in the longer game. In terms of if you want to survive as a professional, often the best way to do that is to put yourself in the most plus EV situation. One of the ways I describe it to my clients is if you were in a hand, you would want to get your money in as good as possible see your table and seat selection in exactly the same way. So is this the most plus EV thing? If, if you're happy to get your money in good at the table, you should be happy to get your money in good in the table selection and the casino selection, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, does that make sense from that side, Trisha? Oh my God, it does. And you know what? I wrote down two things that I thought were, you know, right around this topic, but that make the biggest you know, impact, I think. And one is your goal is to have zero ego at the table. And two, think of your fold button as a weapon. Those are my two favorite ideas. Well, I certainly like one of those very much. The <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, for those of you who are out there and saying, oh, no, it doesn't make sense for me to do that. We're going to put his numbers on the site. <laughs> He's winning by more than most people are. You know, he's working three days a week and making six figures a year. There is something to this. Don't just discount it because the people on the forums say you should play against the best regs to prove how good you are. And you know what, Elliot? There's just one more thing, too. It's like if he works three days a week and he's on the toughest table, it's a lot different than if he's working three days a week on the easiest tables. You know what I mean? It's a different, different world. So I th as I say, I think more poker players should think about, you know, what's the most plus EV situation rather than just what's the most plus EV way of playing this hand. If you think about the macro level, uh, you know, sometimes that can be so much more financially, you know, profitable for you than those decisions you make in the hands themselves. 
Absolutely. So I'm going to go out and look for some really easy opponents to play against. So head out to the Midwest, Trisha. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So uh, Trisha, where can people find out about you? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Dr. Trisha Cardner, or you can go to my website, drtrishacardner.com. And all of my details for coaching or my products are at pokermindcoach.com. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye, guys. You've been listening to the Mindset Advantage podcast with Elliot Rowe and Dr. Trisha Gardner. To get any resources mentioned in the episode or to listen to past shows, visit pokermindcoach.com forward slash TMA podcast. Thanks for listening.